Uh, let's see. I'll tell you when we're live. Hold on. Let's see. We are live with Dr. Robert Syngenis. Now, unfortunately, there is a 10-second delay. So by the time you hear me speak, it will be a 10-second delay. 10-second delay, but it's an honor and privilege to have Dr. Robert Syngenis to come here. And he's going to present the Roman Catholic perspective of the scriptures, what the Roman Catholic Church believes about the scriptures and why they don't accept sola scriptura. So what I want to do is allow Dr. Syngenis to introduce himself, his background, his ministry, his website, and then we'll take it from there. So Dr. Syngenis, who are you? <laughs> well, I, uh, I was born and raised a Catholic back in the 1960s. And then I had a very interesting experience in college, um, was introduced to an evangelical and he actually brought me back to the Catholic Church. He didn't intend to. He wanted me to go to be a Protestant. But uh, I went back to the Catholic Church. And for the first time, I had really understood what my Catholic Church was all about. When I was growing up, I was sort of in a nominal Catholic family. So you just did what you were supposed to do. But you, you left the church on Sunday and... You didn't remember it back until maybe the next Sunday, you know. So that's how I grew up. But I became more intensive in my faith uh, when I was 19 years old. I went back to the Catholic Church for six months and very high on my church. But I had never looked at the Protestant side of things. And I started to listen to a few radio programs, read a few books, little tracks here and there. And I began to think, you know, I'm, I never thought about this. You know, am I in the wrong religion? Because they keep telling me my religion is steeped in tradition and rituals and bells and smells and all that kind of stuff. And have I been missing something? Is there something purer, simpler? that I can have as my faith that doesn't seem so complicated like the, the Catholic faith does. You know, the indulgences and purgatory and Mary and the sacraments and all these things seem to be things that they added on to the, Catholic, the Christian faith that made it much more complex than it needed to be. And when I had come back to faith in Jesus, uh, when I was 19, it was the Bible that had done that for me. I just read the Bible for, gosh, what was it, six months, maybe a little bit more than that, I was reading the Bible. And as Catholics, you don't really read the Bible too much. <laughs> so you, uh, you hear the Bible on Sundays, you know, during the epistle or the gospel, or whatever. But, you know, most Catholics don't sit home and read the Bible. Uh, so the Bible was something new for me. And I remember when I was in my college dormitory, I was reading it and I went to sleep with a particular verse on my mind, which was, uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight, where Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, take my yoke upon me, um, and blah, blah, blah. And I went to sleep with that verse on my mind that night and I woke up the next morning and I knew was I was a new man. I was not the same person that went to sleep the night before. And that was what, 45 years ago. And I can still see that experience in my mind as if it happened yesterday. So the word of God was very powerful. So somebody might think, well, you picked the wrong guy to talk about more than the Bible, you know, uh, because the Bible was such a tremendous impetus in my life to come to faith in Jesus Christ. And as I went on in my, my Christian life, um, I made the Bible. I, I said to myself, if the Bible can do that for me, change my life so dramatically, then I want to study this book for the rest of my life. And so I made it my purpose to study it. And uh, I remember I used to get jobs uh, while going to college 
in, at a small hotel that I had worked on the graveyard shift. And I studied the Bible all for 11 to 7, 11 at night to 7 in the morning. For 10 years, I did this. And I, I became very familiar with the Bible, I can tell you that. But uh, so I made it my life. And ever since then, that was 45 years, I've been doing the same thing. I study the Bible probably about five, six, seven hours a day, every day except Sunday. <laughs> Ask my wife, she can tell you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and I've written 45 books uh, because of that, you know, all based on the Bible most of them anyway um i i went to george washington university i was there as a physics major because i was going to be a doctor like my father a medical doctor and i let i changed that to a religion major and i graduated as a religion major from george washington university i then went to westminster theological seminary uh, in the early 1980s, that's uh, one of the top Protestant seminaries in the world. That's in Philadelphia. And I graduated from there with a uh, master's degree. And so, you know, I was on my way and I had, I had the credentials. And so that's how I got started. Then, um, Going back to when I was 19 years old, I had, I had gone to the Catholic Church, as I said, for six months. Somebody told me about the Protestant Church. I began to listen to Protestant theology. And I somehow I was saying, look, there's something simpler and less complex than the Catholic Church. I think the Protestants got it. And so for the next 17 years, I was a card-carrying Protestant, I was, I was in and out of probably five or so different churches, you know, Baptist, Presbyterian, independent Bible churches, Church of Christ was one of them. Um, you know, so, so I had, I had a pretty good experience overall in the Protestant churches. Then when I reached about 37 or so in 1992, I, I, was introduced to the Catholic side again. And but I had hated Catholics. I mean I had I just didn't want anything to do with them. But somebody one of the things that had converted me that deals with our subject tonight is someone had asked me, if you believe that the Bible is your only authority, then where does the Bible say that? I mean after all, if you're going to have the Bible be the only authority that you look at somewhere that bible must say that it's the only authority can you show me a verse in scripture where it says that and um you know <laughs> wasn't able to do that you know i could point to some verses that might suggest the bible's authoritative well not suggest actually say the bible's authoritative but the question that issue was is the bible your only authority and whereas the church, tradition, rituals, whatever, they have no authority whatsoever. So it's just the Bible. Uh, that question rocked me quite a bit. And that opened up the door for me to go examine a lot of other things in the Catholic Church. And so I read a book um, written by Cardinal Gibbons that was um, basically an apologetic book. How to do Catholic apologetics. And he went through the Eucharist, the sacraments, Mary, indulgences, purgatory, the whole gamut. And he gave some pretty good answers that me as a Bible scholar, I would look at these and I would say, there's something to this. There's something to this. So I had uh, a couple of friends that brought over those books for me. And they uh, wanted to know how I was doing. And I said, well, I put the book server on the side there. I'm not sure what I want to do yet. And so I, I thought about it for three days. And after three days, I was convinced that, yes, I made a big mistake many years ago. I should have never joined the Protestant church. I am now, I want to go back to the Catholic church. That was in 1992. 
And then in 1993, I started my organization that I still work for now called Catholic Apologetics International. And that is a Catholic uh, corporation that deals with apologetics. That is how you teach and defend the Catholic faith. And in that faith, we don't believe in sola scriptura. That is, we don't believe the Bible is our only authority. And so I wrote a book in 1996 with, what, seven other gentlemen uh, who are still in apologetics today. And we published that book uh, with Queenship Publishing. And that book is called Not By Scripture Alone. And that's about 650 pages long. And it has everything in there that you would want to know about the issue of Sola Scriptura. And uh, I just published a hardback edition uh, of it, as a matter of fact. Do um, you want me to get a copy of it? So that you can, can you show them? And then we'll also give a link to your website. And so, so they can get it. It's, uh, I know I have... I have one, but it's stored away in a box somewhere that I don't have access to. But yes, if you can show it to them, there is a 10 second delay. And then folks, once he finishes introduction, what he does, he's going to then uh, give a presentation. And then after that Q and A, so you guys are free to ask questions and we have to be sensitive to his time. So he's been gracious enough to, to come and do this. Lord willing, we'll field out the questions. You can ask questions, but keep it relevant to the topic. We're not gonna make it personal. And by the way, we do have Roman Catholics here, Orthodox and Protestants. So you got a mixed bag today, doctor. And someone just chided me that I didn't put doctor in front of your name. So forgive me for that. You made me feel bad. I'll it's put it. Right. All, right. All right. So this is, let me see if I can get it just right. So I don't get any glare on it. There you go. Uh, not by scripture alone. Uh, forward by Peter Kreeft. He's another Catholic apologist. And... Um, the, the subtitle is A Catholic Critique of the Protestant Doctrine of Sola Scriptura. And you can see it's, what, well, that's about 700 pages or so. And we have um, some endorsed, these are some of the people that wrote in it. Um, Phil Blosser up here. He's a, a professor at a college. I forget where he's at now. Um, who is that there? Can't read that. Robert Festigi, mm, yes, Dr. Sir. Robert Festigi. He is um, an, another college professor. Um, who is that here? Joseph Gallegos. He did all the uh, patristic material. And there's probably 150 pages of patristic material from the fathers all supporting the uh, Catholic version, not Sola Scriptura. Uh, Patrick Madrid, I believe he still has a, a, a apologetics organization. Uh, then up here, um, Mitchell Pacwa, he is uh, the host of EWTN. I, don't, I think he might still be the host of EWTN. Uh, Mark Shea, Mark Shea is a more liberal uh, member of our group here. Uh, but at that time, he was at least conservative enough that he could write that portion. Peter Stravinskis, I'm not sure if he's still around or not. Uh, Father Peter Stravinskis, he has a PhD. And then lastly, myself. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, and I worked that, I, I wrote that at the worst time in my life, by the way. I wrote Not by Faith Alone and this book, Not by Scripture Alone, at the, at the worst time of my life, which you already know about. Yeah. <laughs> now, was that as an introduction? If you can, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the full screen. And if you can take 30 minutes, 40 minutes or more or less, it's up to you. If you can educate those who are not Catholics, what is the Roman Catholic view of Scripture? And then your reasons why Sola Scriptura are not biblical. So I'm going to put the full screen and do I do apologize for the noise. Unfortunately, I'm in my room and by the street next time I'm going to move. I do apologize for that because I don't want you to be distracted. So I'm going to give you now I'm going to put you on full screen. I'm still learning StreamYard. You can take 30 minutes, 40 minutes less, whatever you want. So that people understand, because as I was telling you before we went on, unfortunately, in the 90s, Muslims like a, a Muslim apologist named Shabrali 
would quote the late Father Raymond E. Brown and his destructive views of scripture to try to discredit the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture. So now we not only had to battle Muslims, but these so-called scholars who profess to be Christian and their damning views of scripture. And since he claimed to be Roman Catholic, many people think this is the Roman Catholic view, that the Bible's full of errors and we don't know who the authors are. But as from following you, I know that's not the historic position of the Roman Catholic Church. So if you can tell the people what does the official position of the Roman Catholic Church view is concerning Scripture, is it inspired, is it inerrant, is it infallible, and why biblically the Roman Catholics reject sola scriptura. So let me give you the full screen. And you let me know when you're ready to take Q&A. Let me just get there. Like I said, I'm learning how to work this gizmo. It's yours. Go ahead. I'm going to get something. Okay. All right. Now, I, I, I am embarrassed by the fact that I did not prepare any notes for this. So this is all off the cuff. <laughs> but I've been doing it for so long that um, this, notes sometimes become distracting for me. So I just speak from my heart and my mind just to let you know. So, as you said, the first place we want to begin is what is the Roman Catholic view of Scripture? Roman Catholic view of Scripture is the highest view I have ever found amongst all the churches that I have gone to. And I was quite, not shocked, but I was quite um, excited to see that because when I came back to the church, well, if the church had said, well, we don't believe the Bible's inspired anymore, we don't believe it's inerrant, uh, I don't think I would have made that trek. As, as I said before, scripture to me was and is my life. Um, and I've written many books about it, uh, commentaries, um, done, you know, deep exegesis of scripture. Um, I view scripture in my science books. Uh, so scripture is just everywhere for me. So if it wasn't inspired in an era, I can tell you honestly, I wouldn't waste my time. I would not waste my time. And I'll get to Raymond Brown in a minute, and he's a story all by himself. Um, so the Catholic Church's view of scripture is a high, high view of scripture in that every word of the canonical books is inspired by the Holy Spirit, okay? As 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for doctrine, training, correction, and righteousness, blah, blah, blah. And that word there is theopneustos in Greek. The only, it's a hapax legomena in the Greek New Testament. It means it's the only time it's used. And it's funny that it's a, it's metaphorical in a sense because it's Theo is God and Nupstos is the Holy Spirit or, or breathed. So you can say that scripture is breathed or scripture is the breath of God, so to speak. And, you know, leave it to Paul to use uh, sort of a metaphorical term there, although that term was used in classical Greek as well, but it's still God breathed. Well, what exactly does God breathe mean, you see? Because when we think of breathing, we think of exhaling air and inhaling air, and does God have a breath? Or what? What? what is the message Paul's trying to get to us? Uh, he uses another word, was it 2 Peter, uh, or 1 Peter 1.20, 1 Peter one. Verses 10 to 12, he uses another uh, word. Um, and it's, it's, it's a little bit um, um, not as metaphorical, but it's still not as precise as we would like it. You know, a lot of us scholars would want a sort of a technical definition. What do you mean by inspired? So uh, they've been fighting about that back and forth for a long time. And Sometimes they create some ambiguities in their definitions, and this may be a reason why Raymond Brown went off on the tangent that he did, but we'll get back to that in a minute. But at any word, at any rate, what we mean by the fact, the way the popes had defined it, for example, Leo the Thirteenth, 
in his encyclical of 1893, Providentissimus Deus. And the Council of Trent said the same thing. It basically said that scripture was dictated. Dictated. Okay, so he uses that, that word three times, dictated. Now, there's a lot of controversy about that today because some people believe in what they call organic inspiration where you have the mind and the vocabulary of the particular author of the New Testament, you know, Paul, Peter, John, whoever it is. And you can tell that these writers, not all the time, however, <laughs> but you can tell mostly that a particular writer has a particular vocabulary. He has a way of how he uses the Greek grammar that's different from somebody else in the New Testament. So you can see that there is this personality, human personality in scripture, so much so that you can pick out the personality that's writing the particular book. Like if we looked at the book of Romans, we could see it and say, yeah, that's obviously Paul. It's not John, because John's language is very simple. As he, when he writes first, John, 2nd John, 3rd John. Very simple. And so is his gospel. Um, now, when, he, when you come to the apocalypse, however, John gets a little complicated. But again, this is what I'm saying. You can, you can tell partly that who the author is of the book, but when you come to the apocalypse, if you didn't know John had written it, it'd be a hard guess to figure, well, of the three, Peter, John, and Paul, it looks like Paul might have written up the Apocalypse because it's so complicated. Uh, so there you, you, you can't be positive about how the author is going to fit in. And whatever the case, whatever the amount of the organic element is in the inspiration of Scripture, the Catholic Church says that in the end, it really doesn't matter because God is the author of every word in scripture, okay? And that's why he uses the word dictated, like, like John is a stenographer or Paul is a stenographer. Uh, a stenographer, like in a court of law, sometimes probably doesn't even know what they're writing and is going to copy down in, in their little machine what was said. And the personality of the stenographer does not enter in at all. So, but that's how strong the Catholic Church's understanding of the dictation from the Holy Spirit is. And yet the church still leaves room for the personality of the individual author. So those two combined, okay, shake them up. And what do you get? Well, you get a strong view of scripture that we don't know exactly how they fit together. We don't know that. We just know that we can trust that when we read scripture, we are reading God's very word. However it came to us, whatever personality of the author God used, the fact remains that the words that were chosen were the words God wanted in scripture. Okay. So that's the Catholic view of scripture. And that has always been the Catholic view of scripture from the time of the fathers uh and we're talking about the early fathers uh you know justin martyr irenaeus ignatius uh lactantius all the early fathers believe that and the latter fathers now we're talking here about chrysostom augustine jerome ambrose you know all the big boys everybody had the same there was nothing they really ever argued about they all believed that every word of scripture was inspired by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it was, there was never really an argument about that. As a matter of fact, even the heretics were using scripture because they were trying to figure out, you know, who's Jesus? Uh, how can he be? A, that's what they were concerned about. How could Jesus be God and man at the same time? How can there be three persons in one God and yet still you don't have three gods, you have one God in three personalities. How can that be? So they argued back and forth about that for a long time in the first centuries. Nobody was arguing about 
scripture. Uh, the church had already settled uh, basically what she meant by inspired scripture, and she was using that to form the canon, as a matter of fact. There were only 27 books chosen for the New Testament out of 200 or so that were around at that time. The New Testament apocryphal books, uh, the pseudepigraphal books, are all vying to get into the canon of Scripture, and the church only chose 27. Why? Based on her understanding of the inerrancy of Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture, you see. So it was a very strong doctrine, and that held through throughout the Middle Ages. It held through um, up until, let's say, the late 1700s are when things started to change. And sorry to say, my friends, but it, it started to change in the Protestant churches, okay? Uh, Luther and Calvin had a very strong understanding of the inspiration of scriptures. So did Wesley, so did um, uh, Melanchthon, uh, who else? Um, most of your Protestant preachers up until, well, even today, they, they have, but today they're hedging their bets a little bit, but uh, they had a very strong view of scripture, but there was a whole other side to Protestantism that started to grow out of the Enlightenment period. And this is when Protestantism got into the universities of Europe. And once you do that, if you don't have your belt buckled real tight, uh, they <laughs> they will loosen it and take it off, and your pants are going to come down. And that's basically what happened. In the Protestant churches, you had a liberal movement that started way back with guys like Paulus, Schleiermacher, um, all the big names back then, the, the German, mostly German, some French, some Swedish, scholars were basically saying we don't believe the bible's inspired we're going to treat it basically it's called historical criticism and we are going to examine the bible like we would examine shakespeare or homer or you know whoever and we don't take it as a given that although these books claim to be inspired by god they were actually written by men. And if that is the case, we know they make mistakes. They embellish. They use figures of speech. They uh, will talk about miracles that in reality, we know they don't occur, you see. Or they will pretend that they're prophesying when actually uh, the liberal scholars will tell us they weren't prophesying. They were just taking a an event and writing about it you know, a couple hundred years later, making it look like it was written as prophecy because they're it was 200 years later, they know what happened, you see. So that's how they explained away prophecy in the Old Testament or miracles. You know, Jesus really didn't feed 5,000. Uh, they all brought their lunches, but the apostles made it look like Jesus performed a miracle, you see. So that's how they explained away the miracles. Uh and you had what they call the historical search for Jesus at that time. Uh, and they had two of them. And what they were trying to do was find out who's the real Jesus. Uh, we can do away with all this prophecy and all these miracles and all the hullabaloo around Jesus. And let's just get to the real Jesus. And, you know, Albert Schweitzer, the great humanitarian, was one of those in the historical quest for Jesus, and Bultmann and Barth, Bruner, all these um, liberal European scholars were all going to give us the real Jesus. And they searched and they searched, and guess what? They utterly failed because they found out that you really can't separate the historical Jesus from the Jesus of miracles, from the Jesus of prophecy, from the Jesus of redemption. And by, when I say redemption, I'm saying basically these same liberal scholars did away with the second coming as they did away with the inspiration and inerrancy of scripture. They did away with the virgin birth. You know, they did away with um, the resurrection. 
these guys didn't believe anything anymore. And yet they were the mainline Protestant denominations in Europe. Okay. How do I know all this? Well, I went to a seminary, Westminster Theological Seminary, that was formed in 1929 that broke off from Princeton Theological Seminary in 1929 because Princeton had become so thoroughly liberal in their theology that they didn't believe in Christianity anymore. And so a bunch of uh, our, my uh, former uh, professors got together, John Murray and a bunch of other ones, and split off, and we're going to keep the Presbyterian Church conservative, no liberalism. And so today you have the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, you have the PCA, Presbyterian Church in America, and a, a few others. At any rate, they try to keep it preserved. But the mainline Protestant denominations or Presbyterian denominations were all liberal. And they're the ones that have the big churches in the cities, New York, Chicago, L.A. <clears throat> and, you know, they get invited by the presidents and uh, they get called on TV and all this stuff. So uh, they had quite a prestige among them. <clears throat> but they didn't believe the Bible anymore. Basically, the Bible was full of mistakes. And if you read something like the Genesis flood in Genesis 6 to 9, that never occurred. Basically, what they're saying is that these Jewish writers who came at very different times, according to the what they call the documentary hypothesis, there were four basic writers of Genesis, so they claim. And um, <clears throat> one of them was, let's say, came out of the Babylonian captivity. And after being in captivity under the Babylonians for 70 years, and now you're going back to Jerusalem, well, you want something to invigorate your people. You want to make your God, Yahweh, bigger than Marduk, the God of the Babylonians. And so what are you going to do, according to these liberal, liberal scholars? Well, you're going to write a story about the creation, and you're going to show that your God's greater than their God. Has nothing to do with creation, per se, okay, the six days of creation, but it, it goes pound for pound against Marduk and shows your, your God is greater than him, you see. And that's the liberal mentality, is it has nothing to do with creation. They just needed it as a prop to hold up the people on their way back to Jerusalem. That's the way the story goes. So the same with the flood, you know, that's that the, the Jews got that from some ancient culture in Mesopotamia that had a flood one day and, um, and then the documents survived and the Jews copied those documents, you see. So it has nothing to do with Noah and the flood. The Jews just picked Noah as their, you know, poster boy and uh, created a flood story, to have a flood story like all the other uh, cultures of that day and before, you see. So basically everything in the Bible was just torn to pieces. Um, <clears throat> so you can see now the dividing road is this, the Christian, so-called Christian scholars who, and they'll use the word Christian just like we do, okay? They mean totally different things by it but they'll use the word Christian. They'll use the word resurrection. They'll use the word coming of Christ. Uh, they'll use, um, in, they'll even use the words inspiration of scripture because they each have their different ideas of what inspiration really means. It means that the man was inspired, you see, not that God came into his mind and dictated scripture to him. Oh, that's anathema to them, okay? So, hey, you, like I said, you got your liberal scholars, Bonhoeffer, Bart, um, Boltmann, all the big names, okay? This, this is what they're teaching in Protestant seminaries still to this very day, okay? Now, what happened was the Catholics up until about 1940s uh, weren't allowed to go into this stuff. All the Catholic priests and seminarians, they weren't allowed to study this stuff. They knew it was out there, okay? Because we had one guy, his name was Father uh, Tilliard de Chardin, and 
he started like around the turn of the 1900s and began spouting all kinds of liberal stuff that was totally off the wall. And he was condemned by a, a couple of popes, but somehow he managed to survive. Uh, but even when he was around, there were a lot of um, Catholic scholars who were wanting to go into this new hermeneutic, this new historical critical understanding of the Bible, just like the Protestants were. And the Protestants were, you know, basically showing up all these Catholics. The Catholics, all they knew was their tradition and, you know, a, a few Bible verses here and there. None of them hardly knew any Greek and Hebrew. And all, all the Protestant scholars knew the Greek and Hebrew. So they were light years ahead of the Catholics in regard to this liberal movement, okay? But once um, Pius XII wrote his encyclical in 1943, titled Divine, uh, Divino Aflante Spiritu, and calling upon the Spirit of God to help, he, he basically made a mistake. And that mistake was to say, okay, um, you can go study the Protestant liberal hermeneutic, but I don't want you to believe it. I don't want you to go there and actually imbibe it, okay? I want you to go find out what they're doing and, you know, report back to me, so to speak, um, what, what the story is. And lo and behold, as soon as he said, you can go study it, the floodgates were opened. And these guys were already Catholic revolutionaries. They were already liberal in their hearts and minds, and they were going to go full blast and to heck with the precautions that Pius XII had given them. And as a matter of fact, those Catholics from the 19, late 1940s through the 50s, 60s, 70s, they did more damage to scripture in those 40 years than the Protestant, Protestants, the Protestant liberals had done for the previous 200 years, beginning in the late 1700s. See, the Protestant liberals had to basically cut their teeth. Uh, it was all new to them, you see. They had this general idea that they could examine the Bible like some other kind of book, like Shakespeare or Homer, and do away with this whole idea that it was directly inspired by the Spirit of God. But they had you know, to go down different channels and say, well, don't go here, you can go here, and then they had to come up with all kinds of critical apparatus like redaction criticism, form criticism, textual criticism, you name it. They had, um, you know, multitudinous ways of cutting the Bible up, so to speak, to show that it was just a human book. But that took a long time. The Catholics had already read that stuff, at least the least liberal Catholics, and so they were way ahead, and all they had to do was advance now, which they did. And that brings us to a guy like Raymond Brown, Father Raymond Brown. Uh, Raymond Brown, um, I have been speaking against Raymond Brown as not representative of the Catholic Church for many years. And I still hold that view today and even more staunchly than I did before. Raymond Brown was one of those uh, priests, scholars, who lived around this time, the 40s, 50s, 60s, after Pius XII had said, okay, you can go study the Protestant liberal hermeneutic and find out what you can. Uh, they not only studied it, they took it to heart, so much so that Raymond Brown taught at Union Theological Seminary in New York, probably the premier liberal Protestant seminary in the world. And he he, as a Catholic priest, was teaching there, okay? Uh, I know all about Union Theological Seminary because when I went to George Washington University and graduated as a religion major, I had to put up with all the, the professors there, some of which graduated from Union Theological Seminary. And here I was, a young Christian, trying to live my Christian faith, and all day long, these gentlemen were telling me, well, the Bible's not inspired. It's not inerrant. All this stuff is basically made up, uh, blah, 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 you know, day after day after day. 
And um, I held my own. I held my own. And I had some help along the way. And I remember one of the, and this is when I was a Protestant, okay? One of the help, basic helps I had at that time was Dr. Francis Schaefer. I don't know if anybody out there remembers him or not. He died in 1984, and I corresponded with him. And um, I don't know what I would have done without him. I really don't, because he helped me clear through all the crap that these guys were saying and showed me, uh, you know, what basic Christianity was all about and how to fight these guys on the philosophical and metaphysical level. So uh, I attribute a lot to him in my early days. Uh, and then when I came to the Catholic Church, what, some 10 or so years later, I find out that Raymond Brown is the uh, professor, scholar par excellence that is leading the charge of all the liberals against the inspiration of scripture. And um, man, there's, there's a ton I could say about Raymond Brown. He basically questions almost every doctrine in the Catholic Church. And the way he writes his books, see, because he knows that if he comes right out and says there is no, um, there is no inspiration of Scripture, or if he comes out and says there's no resurrection, or there's no second coming, or there's no uh, virgin birth, or there's no, you know, you go down and name the traditional doctrines, he either doubts them, questions them, or outright rejects them. As a Catholic, however, he knows he can't remain a Catholic if he comes right out and says, I reject the virgin birth. So what he does in his books is he'll put them in interrogatives. Can we still believe in the virgin birth after this issue or this study or this event, blah, blah, blah? And it'll be a big question mark at the end of the sentence. Anybody who does that, you can't be convicted of believing in heresy because obviously you're just questioning. Nothing wrong with questioning, is there? So he found the perfect medium to get his ideas across, yet cast doubt in the minds of all his students because they know what he's saying when you put a question mark after you're tearing down one of the traditional doctrines of the church, okay? Let me give you an example of what a guy like Raymond Brown does. And then I'm gonna give you an example of the Catholic understanding of tradition, the magisterium and scripture. And maybe we can wrap this up. I don't know, I don't even know how long I've gone. Um, but uh, we, if you are familiar with the Catholic church at all, you know, we had a major council in 1962, started in 1962 called Vatican Council II. It was a continuation of Vatican Council I from 1870 that never really got finished. Uh, so they were going to pick up the ball again in the 1960s and basically finish Vatican Council I, except that it turned to be one of the bigger councils that we've ever had. And it ended in 1965. Uh, there are 16 documents in Vatican II dealing with various subjects. One of them deals with the scripture. And that document is called Dei Verbum, okay, the word of God. And... The, the, there was a big fight among the prelature, that's the bishops at Vatican II, of what they were going to say about the inspiration of Scripture. And the liberals, who basically threw their weight around, not only with this document, but a lot of other documents, and grabbed the microphones and wouldn't give time to the opposition. Yeah, it was a real, a real cat fight. Um, anyway, they got most of the time and there were what they call, they, they do drafts of the documents. So if they did a draft on the inspiration of scripture, they would write drafts of it. And then each draft was called a schema. And so they would vote on the first schema. And if that wasn't approved, then they would go and make a second schema. Uh, whoever objected would get the words changed a little bit 
And so then they would come up with a second draft. And then they came up with a third draft. One of the drafts was so bad that the Pope had to step in and only at the last minute, because one of the Cardinals had warned him that the draft basically said the Bible's not inspired. He had to step in, stop that draft, and <coughs> then they had to vote for the final draft, which was schema four. In that draft, the language that they agreed upon was goes something like this. Um, all scripture is inspired by God and given for the sake of our salvation. And then it would quote the rest of 2 Timothy 3.16. Profitable correction and training and righteousness and all that. But let me just show you how slimy and how dastardly these Catholic liberals are. So they took this phrase out of De Verbum, and it's chapter 11, in case you ever want to go look at it. So all scriptures inspired for the sake of our salvation. Now, there might be a few words here and there that I'm missing, but that's the basic thought. All scriptures inspired for the sake of our salvation. What these liberals did with this is they said, okay, well, first of all, for the conservatives, it was it was obvious what Dave Verbum 11 was teaching. That is, all scriptures inspired and God did it because he wants us to be saved. And so we know that whenever we go to the scripture, we know we're reading the inerrant word of God himself. And we don't have to question it. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to doubt. We know that it's the word of God, and therefore, it's conducive to our salvation. Every word of God in Scripture leads us to salvation. The, the conservatives knew that. And that's the way, prima facie, the document reads. The liberals had another idea. And it's not wasn't just an idea. It is the major teaching of the Catholic Church today, the modern Catholic Church. Though it is wrong, totally wrong, it's the major teaching that is in practically all the seminaries, all the universities, and I'm talking about Notre Dame, Loyola, all the biggies, all the high schools, all the colleges, and even in the, some of the Bible translations, the notes of the Bible translations that the Catholics make today. This view is dominant. But it's the one that you would never get out of De Verbum unless somehow you could twist it to conform to what you wanted it to be. And here's how they did it. So the, the sentence at issue is, all scriptures inspired and inerrant for the sake of our salvation. And so the liberals took this phrase, for the sake of our salvation, out of the context and said this as their conclusion. All scripture that is inspired is scripture that talks about our salvation. Subtle, but enough where they could get their point across, which was only scripture that talks directly about salvation is inspired by God. Okay. And even then we would question, well, and what do you mean by inspiration? Okay, so that was that would be a whole other issue that's not even dealt with in Day Verbum 11. We're just assuming that we all have the same definition of inspiration. Well, that's to be decided. Well, I'm just dealing with the phrase itself. Okay, they twisted it to mean that only scripture that talks about salvation is inspired in an error by God. So what does that mean? And again, this is what's taught in the major institutions and I'm including the Vatican itself, okay? And there's been no official interpretation given to this document, De Verbum 11, that we're discussing. But everybody's all assumed because the liberals took control of the Catholic Church and everybody all assumes that their interpretation of it is correct. And we've been going on that now for what? 
almost 60 some odd years. And the whole understanding of scripture has been ripped from our children, ripped from our tradition. For 2,000 years, we've taught the same thing. And all of a sudden, you know, this council comes along and the words are twisted and no official interpretation is given to it later by any pope. As a matter of fact, all the popes are going in line with it unofficially without defining what the meaning is. And that's where we are where we are today. And where does this come in handy? Let's take an, uh, an issue like homosexuality. Okay. If scripture is only inerrant and inspired when it talks about a direct matter of salvation, well, homosexuality isn't a direct matter of salvation, is it? That's a moral issue. As a matter of fact, the liberals say that's a cultural issue because in Paul's culture, oh, yeah, they were against homosexuality. Not in our culture, of course, see, because we've advanced since Paul. We're a lot more intelligent and a lot more sophisticated, culturally speaking, than St. Paul was. And so we have a different view of homosexuality. But here's the key. It has nothing to do with salvation proper. It doesn't deal with salvation directly. So it's not inspired and inerrant. Thus, that means St. Paul can make an error in his judgment against homosexuality, because he was not inspired by the Holy Spirit. Okay? So you see what this does. The You can add any issue you want to that. You can add contraception, abortion, the role of women in the church, uh, the sacraments. You can, uh, well, the sacraments deal more with salvation, but uh, any of these peripheral issues that just deal with eth ethics, morals, all that, well, it's not dealing with directly with salvation, the liberals tell us. So we don't have to pay attention to it. That's just the opinion of St. Paul. And as a matter of fact, he had a pretty strong issue with women. He didn't like women being in the, in the uh, ministry at all. They couldn't even talk, according to St. Paul, in church. Okay. So if the liberals today in the Catholic Church, and it's leaning toward that, are trying to make women priests, and sorry to say, the Protestant denominations have already succumbed to that in allowing their women to be bishops and priests, like the Episcopals, the Anglicans, and some other ones. Um, and there are some that conservatives that have not succumbed to it, but still, um, they're trying to do that in the Catholic Church today. Why? Well, because that's not a matter of salvation, you see. That's just dealing with the role of women. And so you can slice and dice it till basically you've emptied the whole scripture of anything that's culturally relevant, and you're left with just these ideas of salvation, whatever they think they are, okay? And so you can see how the whole thing can be ripped apart, literally. And that's where we are today in the Catholic Church, sorry to say. Okay. So, and then if you're going to read Genesis chapters 1 to 11, you know, with all the fantastic stories that are there, and Adam and Eve, and Noah, and the Tower of Babel, and the flood, blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, as you'll find in the, in the most popular Catholic Bible, the New American Bible, you'll find a great translation. It has one of the greatest translations I've ever seen in Scripture. Uh, but the footnotes, don't read them, because all they're going to be doing is denying all the historical events that occurred. You're going to say, oh, this didn't really happen, that didn't really happen, you know, blah, 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 blah. That's what you find in most Catholic Bibles today, in their footnotes or their endnotes. Okay, so, um, yeah, we're, we're in a fix, just like the Protestants are. The Protestants are having the same problem and it's just getting worse and worse every decade that goes by i can tell you safely if you look at the tradition of the church the fathers the medievals the popes that wrote about inspiration and inerrancy none of them agree with raymond brown or any of his entourage and there's dozens of them out there all teaching in our catholic seminaries today okay so um, now to wrap up um, let me give why 
why we as Catholics don't believe in sola scriptura. First is the scripture doesn't teach sola scriptura, okay? There is no passage of the Bible you can turn to. And I've quizzed many Protestants on this, believe me. I would not waste my time on this if I had any doubt in my mind about what was right. I asked them for passages that teach where the Bible says it's the only authority. Now, what they'll do is they'll come back and give me passages that speak of the Bible as authoritative or as um, uh, the precious word of God from the Psalms. You know, I follow every word. I follow the law, all this stuff. And I'm saying, yeah, I know what they say. Okay, they're extolling scripture and they have every right to do so because it's the word of God. But where does the Bible itself say that it is the only authority that were the highest authority, if you want to put it that way, as opposed to what, the, what our authorities in the church are telling us or what our tradition or both combined have told us? Okay, so since the Bible does not claim to be the only authority, then we can't use the Bible to say it's the only authority. Is basically what it boils down to. Okay, and the moment you try to find a verse that says the Bible is the only authority, you're stuck in the mud. You see, because you are now admitting that you need to find a verse that says the Bible is the only authority. Once you go into that little cavern and you take my bait, okay, then you're forced to find the verse, okay? Or you could say, okay, well, I'm not going to enter into that question. Well, you're still admitting defeat because now you have to prove how you believe in Sola Scriptura and how are you going to do so if your only authority is the Bible and yet you're not going to go in and try to find the answer from the Bible as to why the Bible is the only authority, then that means you've become the authority, you see? And you know that can't be. So you're trapped either way you go. Now, let me give you a good example of why Sola Scriptura doesn't work. Let's take the issue of John chapter 3, in the instance where Nicodemus comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to be saved? Or, you know, how can a man enter the kingdom of God? And what is Jesus' answer to him? Jesus says, you must be born of water and the spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, simple enough. All right. Now, let's take the word spirit first. Uh, obviously, my salvation is going to have something to do with God. So there's the spirit of God. So somehow the spirit has to be involved. I understand that. And then when we go read in the rest of the New Testament about the spirit's work, we see he's integrally involved in our salvation. Okay. But then you have this other thing there called the water. You know, Jesus could have left the water out if he wanted to, but obviously it was something very important. Otherwise, he wouldn't have put it in there. And that's his answer to Nicodemus. You must be born of water and the spirit. So we know what the spirit is, but what's the water? Well, um, what are you going to do? Uh, the nearest mention of water is in John 4, 2, where the disciples are baptizing people with water. And But that doesn't tell you what the water is there for, what it does, why it's so important. I mean, couldn't I just baptize somebody without water and just, you know, give them the sign of the Holy Spirit and say, brother, you know, I hope you find Jesus and here's how you do it. Repent of your sins and, and hope the Holy Spirit comes into you. Why do we need this water? Okay, so... In other words, what Jesus said to Nicodemus was not something trivial. It was not something unimportant that we can just sort of pass by because we don't know what it means. All right. So various people have tried in history to figure out why is the water there? What does it mean? What does it do? 
some have said, well, the water, uh, you know, this can't be magic. So the water is just a symbol of cleansing, cleansing me from sin. I have to have the water as a symbol to somebody else out there that I've been cleansed of my sin. And if they see me submit to the water, I've humbled myself. And so that all ties in. And now I receive the water and everybody knows, oh, he's been cleansed of his sin, spiritually speaking. The water had nothing to do with it. It was just a symbol. That's a very logical answer to the question. Because, yeah, you know, this is not magic. Um, water is a symbol of cleaning. In many other instances, we wash our clothes with it. Um, so yeah, that, that makes sense that it's cleansing us symbolically. So put those two together and wow, you have come up with a pretty good interpretation. As a matter of fact, I, I think it's pretty good. Uh, somebody else says, well, I don't know because, you know, the word of God, you read the word of God and it convicts you of sin. And that's the thing that God's looking for, for you to repent of your sin so you can become holy. And um, it's the word of God that led you there, though, you see. So it seems to me that the, the word of God is symbolic, it is the symbol that the water is trying to give us. So in other words, you read the Bible, you get the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and now you become born again. That makes sense. Okay, so you have a second interpretation now. Okay, uh, as a matter of fact, that group of people will use Ephesians 5.26, where Paul says, the washing of the water by the word. Wow, that seems to be all three elements there. Washing by the water with the word. Okay, so um, that's a second possibility. There were other people that said, well, look at the context of John 3. Uh, we're talking about being born. Uh, we know that when we're born, we're born in a, we come from an amniotic sac of fluid. That's water. The, the mother's water breaks and she knows she's going to deliver shortly thereafter. And when the baby comes out, the water comes out. And so in that sense, you know, we're born once of water. Okay. Uh, humanly speaking, we're born of water. But um, but uh, to be spiritually saved, we have to be born of the Spirit. And so it makes sense. You know, you're born once as a human. Now you're born once as a, uh, as a child of God because of the Spirit of God. Okay, so two births, one human birth, one spiritual birth. That makes sense. Okay, so we had a lot of people opting for that possibility. Then we have some people opting for somewhere in between those two. Uh, you know, somewhere in between being a symbol and not a symbol, like John Calvin, for example. Um, you know, he wasn't, didn't want to give, give away, and so did Luther, as a matter of fact. Luther believed in um, the same baptism he did as a Catholic. And it didn't, it wasn't until, you know, the next century that other Protestants started to do away with that whole idea. Uh, and Calvin was like the middle road, you know. Partly symbol, partly uh, you know, a real thing that's that's happening, and he didn't know which way to go on it. All right, which leads us to the other definition or the other exegesis of John three five, which is what? Well, that the water is the actual means of grace that God uses to instill the Spirit in us that cleanses our soul. And without that water, the vehicle is not there, and therefore there is no baptism. So the water becomes very important because it's what God actually uses to bring the Spirit to us. Primitive as it may sound to some highly intellectual people. Okay, but that's what the church originally understood. And they called it baptismal regeneration. And said that without the water, there is no baptism. And the water must be distributed, as Jesus said in Matthew 28 and 19. That is, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? So, and that held sway, even up until Luther and partly Calvin. 
even though they disagreed with the church on many other things. And you can look at the fathers. And to a man, the fathers believed in baptismal regeneration. There was not one deviant voice in the patristic period. Nobody saw baptism as symbolic or just mere cleansing or just the word of God or even the amniotic fluid. All of them said that the water itself was the means of grace that God chose and it produced baptismal regeneration. Now, I say that all that to say this. You're looking at John 3, 5. You can't find anywhere in scripture where the reason the water is there is explained for you. Why is the water included? Okay, you might get hints here and there, but there's nothing solid you could sink your teeth into and say, ah, there's the verse, you see. And so what are you going to do? The context doesn't help you. John 4, 2 doesn't help you because they just talk about baptizing with water and that's it. Okay, so what do you do? Well, you go back and you ask the writer, what did you mean when you wrote, you must have water in the spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God? Well, you're going to say to me, well, the writer doesn't exist anymore. And I'm going to say, correct. But that writer had friends. And those friends were told by the apostles what the true inter interpretation was of John 3, 5. And, that's, and they said, okay, that's what we're going with. Even though out of the five interpretations possible, the one that says baptismal regeneration is the truth, is the one that you would say, hmm, I'm not too sure about that one. You're telling me the water is used as a vehicle for grace? What does that mean? Okay, so of the five, it seems to be the hardest one to accept. And yet that's the one the church chose. Why? Because Jesus and the apostles told them that's what tradition is. This is the most important aspect of tradition in the Catholic Church, that the tradition from Jesus and the apostles gives the proper interpretation of the very scriptures we need for our salvation. And then you go down the list. Confession. The Eucharist. Confirmation. Marriage. Priestly orders. And another one we call extreme unction. The anointing of the sick. Each of those has scriptures attached to them. Okay. The anointing of the sick, James 5, 14 and 15. Okay. Confession, John 20, 23. Uh, the Eucharist, John 6, 54. 1 Corinthians 11, 25. Um, confirmation, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 19. And 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um so uh, marriage and divorce, another biggie. Why? Well, because the Protestants believe that they can get divorced and remarried. And the Catholics say, no. If you get divorced, you cannot get remarried. Big issue. Okay, where does that all come from? Uh, and, you know, go down the list. Okay, so in other words, what the tradition does is if you, you're looking at the Bible, the Bible's just a witness to what went on. A lot of times it doesn't give an explanation as to why it said something. It just gives you the historical event. But now you, as a leader of the church, you have to decide, well, what is that water for? Am I just going to make something up that sounds good to me, like it's a cleansing? and just symbolic or could it actually be the very means god is using to bring salvation to someone okay well that's what the church said so if you reject what the church said and you go for your own interpretation well basically you've got another church because the original church did not say that okay scripture doesn't tell you that scripture just says that they were baptized 
So you need another help for the scripture. You need the tradition that gives you the original interpretation of what that scripture says. Because that scripture was way back there too. Okay. And then you're going to need someone to decide the issue for you. You can have scripture and tradition all you want. But if you don't have the third leg to decide what scripture is saying and how it fits into what the tradition is saying and how it's fitting into scripture, there's going to be a massive confusion. Okay. This is why the church was able to fight off all these heretics in the beginning stages with the incarnation and the Trinity and uh, baptism and the canon of scripture is another one. How do you decide the canon of scripture? You have to have an, an absolute authority up there. And that absolute authority can't be just an authority. Perhaps sometimes it can be. But on the major issues, it has to be infallible. It has to have the right decision. Otherwise, Jesus could not lead the church into all truth as he promised by the Holy Spirit. Because we'd all be hampering for, oh, well, what, the Spirit told you that? Well, the Spirit told me this. You see, you have to have one authority to make the decision on those major doctrines. And so there you have your three-legged stool, scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. And it can work no other way. You may get together at church and think that you can make it, but you're going to run into problems. Sooner or later, you're going to run into someone who wants to get married and divorced and someone who wants to know about baptism and someone who wonders whether the Eucharist is just a piece of bread or it actually is Jesus in body like the church originally taught. Uh, or are you going to make up something else? Okay. So that's the reason why we don't believe in Sola Scriptura. Scripture doesn't teach it, and it doesn't work for number two. Okay. I think I've, um, I don't know how long I've gone, but that sort of wraps it up. And uh, if you want to take questions about after that, that's fine. Yeah. Let me just do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. The excellent presentation. There are questions. So. Uh, I want to be sensitive to your time. Uh, it's you. How long? We can take what twenty minutes of questions. I'd be okay. Or um, be uh, I'll go at least a half hour uh, oh, okay. if there's any questions. You know, oh. Yeah, okay. I don't want to cut anybody off. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of questions. I don't know if you could see. I thought maybe you could see the comments to your right. You can't see them. No, I can't see them. Uh, okay, I'm gonna learn how to share it one day. I promise you. But uh, first question. Someone was saying is that that sola scriptura does not mean that the Bible is the only authority. It's the sole infallible rule of faith. Would that then affect your answer to the fact that sola scriptura says it's the sole infallible rule of faith, but not the only authority? Would that somehow affect your response to sola scriptura? You know, uh, I've heard this before, and to me, it's just a semantical argument. It basically says the same thing with different words. Uh, as soon as you use the word soul, you're using the word only. I use the word only authority. He uses soul rule. Well, only authority is soul rule. There's really no difference between the two. Okay, so you really can't polish it up a little bit to make it look nicer. It's still the same pig underneath. Okay. This one, I know you know this because I've heard you discuss it even in your book and came up in your discussion with the... Uh, Matt Slick. Oh, no, that's the wrong one. I apologize. This is the one here. Hi, Robert. What is meant in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6 by not beyond what has been written? All right. Well, if you want to find out the real story on this verse. Now, by the way, I have a little anecdote about this verse. I remember when I was first coming to the Catholic Church back in 1992, I thought of one of my professors back in uh, Westminster Theological Seminary, and I say, I wonder what he would would uh, give for a, if I asked him for a single verse of scripture, I wonder what verse he would give me if I said, where does the Bible teach Sola Scriptura? And so he wrote, he writes back to me, uh, uh, Richard Gaffin is his name, by the way, and I, I think he's, he's retired from there. But at any rate, he writes a letter back to me. He goes, well, I'm in a hurry, 
But um, the verse that comes to mind to me is 1 Corinthians 4, verse 6, where it's quoted here, not beyond what has been written. Okay. And he didn't, he didn't do any exegesis of it, didn't explain why. He just thought that I would see this phrase and I would sort of be settled in my mind. Oh, yeah, there's where Sol Sola Scriptura is taught. Okay. So um, I, I just thought that was pretty um, funny in a way for a, a seminary, one of the prestigious seminaries in the United States to give this passage as his defense for Sola Scriptura. Uh, I just thought that was, um, I don't know. Yeah, I just laughed, actually, that he would do that. I did not I did not follow it up later. Um, but what it did is, says, okay, if they're going to depend on this verse to buttress their whole understanding of Sola Scriptura, and they can't find, which means they can't find any other verse in Scripture besides this obscure passage to prove their theory. OK, uh, that's a little bit that, that's a, in a, you're in a lot of hot water. If that's the case, if this is all you can find to support Sola Scriptura, uh, you're hanging by a thread. OK, so that's the preliminary background to all this in the book, not by scripture alone here. OK. Um, I wrote probably 50 pages on this one verse, 1 Corinthians 4, 6. So if you are interested in finding out the all the ins and outs of 1 Corinthians 4, 6, get a hold of the book. You can buy it at robertsongenis.org in paperback or hardback. Okay. But let me give you a little bit of this. This verse is one of the most difficult in the New Testament, textually speaking, because there are about half a dozen different textual variants in the verse. Uh, if you go pick uh, some Bibles, King James Bible, Revised Standard Version, New American Standard Bible, NIV, um, what else? The New Jerusalem Bible, Jerusalem Bible, New English Bible, you name it. You get, a, get about a dozen of them. Turn to this verse and watch them try to translate it, okay? And you're going to come up with 12 distinctly different translations. OK, so that just tells you the difficulty that's in this verse, textually speaking. In other words, the phrase not beyond what has been written, nobody knows whether that really belongs in there at all or not. OK, so that's the first thing you're going to have to do. If you're going to try to use this passage as a um, as a defense for Sola Scriptura, well, then you pick one of the most non-perspicuous passages in the Bible to ironically tell me about something that's supposed to be very clear. Okay. So you're, you're coming out of the blocks. It's not good for you. Okay. <laughs> so um, if Paul were saying something like this to the Corinthians, let's just look at it historically. Okay. Uh, he says, if he's telling them, don't go beyond what I've written, well, that means that everything that Paul taught them orally. Now, this is in first. This is what fifty-seven A.D. Okay, this is rather early on. Uh, certainly before Second Corinthians or even Third Corinthians, if there was one. But the fact is that Paul is teaching them orally. So why would he come to them and say, "Don't go beyond what I have written"? That would tell the Corinthians not to pay attention to anything he said orally. Because he didn't hear say, accept what I'm going to teach you orally. He didn't say that, did he? Okay. And if this is going to be an abiding statement for all the rest of Christianity, what's well, going to have to mean the same thing for them that it does for us? You see, that there's no oral uh, uh, teaching that we have to go by Paul. It's everything we have to know is written in the scripture. Well, why would Paul write that to the Corinthians? It doesn't make sense. Okay. Especially since many times he said, look, I'm not writing you everything that I want to tell you. And I'm going to tell you the rest of it when I come to see you. Okay. He says that many times in his epistles. First Corinthians 11, 34 and 35, just one example of that. He's teaching about the Eucharist. And then he says, and when I come to see you, I'm going to give you even more information about it. You see. So this verse has, just to wrap it up here, 
If you really want to know it, go read my book and you'll find out why it can't support Sola Scriptura. But this is one of the most abused passages that Protestants use to try to support Sola Scriptura. And I think what they do, they do it out of desperation because there's no other passage in the Bible they can use. So they, they think this is going to solve their problem. It doesn't. It actually creates more problems for them that they can't explain. And so it doesn't get them out of the hole at all. The other question, where does the Bible teach the existence of another infallible authority apart from Scripture? Well, see, here's the mistake. You're, going, you're using the Bible as the only authority and asking me where it says that there has to be another authority. You can't do that. You're assuming that the Bible is your authority, only authority. And if the Bible doesn't say it, then it can't be true. That's a fallacy, you see. But sometimes they're, they're, they get so ingrained in thinking of Sola Scriptura as their absolute that they can't get out of the box. They can't think outside of the box. And this is one perfect example of that. But now that you've asked, let's look at what the Bible says. Uh, the church has always used Mass Matthew chapter 16 when Jesus is talking to Peter and he says, whatever you bind, whatever you lose. Well, what's he talking about there? He's talking about doctrine. Okay. And the you there is the singular you. It's Peter in the singular, not the other apostles. Okay. Uh, so he says, you singular, whatever you bind, heaven shall bound. Uh, that's pretty secure, I'd, I'd say, because heaven can't lie. So whatever heaven bound is going to bind, it's going to have to be true, which means what Peter says about doctrine is going to have to be true. If it was false, then heaven couldn't bind it, you see. So um, that there is showing us that the church is the one that's going to make the decision. Now, of course, she's going to be guided by the Holy Spirit. This is not just a man who's going to make the decision. OK, if heaven is going to promise to bind, you can depend upon it that heaven's going to help Peter make the right decision because the truth of Jesus, as he's promised, has to be given to the church. And how can you have truth if there's going to be error given to the church? Can't have that. As a matter of fact, already in the first part of that pericope in verse 13, uh, P Jesus is asked, who do men say that I am? And Jesus, or Peter says, you are the son of, you are the Messiah, the son of God. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you, but my father in heaven. So right there, Jesus is giving us the paradigm of how Peter's going to get this information so that he can give doctrine to the church. And that is because the father is going to give it to him. It's not going to come from flesh and blood. And therefore, Jesus can say, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That's why we as Catholics look to our authorities for answers like this. Guys, make sure you bring in your questions. He said he's got now about 25 more minutes and we want to respect his time. So I'm trying to field out the questions. I saw this one. So here's one. Can a Protestant, and I guess this is to have you unpack the implication of the question. Can a Protestant please explain to me how if Sola Scriptura is right, how can some Protestants be for abortion, others against it? How do they arrive at opposite conclusions of Scripture is enough? I guess it's with the perspicuity of Scripture. So basically, uh, if he, it, he's asking it is, isn't that true that the fact there's divisions among Protestants shows that the Bible needs an interpreter as you're making your case, your point? I, I think that's plainly obvious. Um, see, the Bible doesn't cover a lot of things, first of all. It doesn't cover a lot of the sexual issues that we deal with today. Um, masturbation is one of them. I mean, I've heard Protestants give like half a dozen different answers on that issue. Okay. Uh, why? Because well, the Bible doesn't deal with the issue. That's why it deals with it in principle, you might say, but not directly. Um, surrogate motherhood, uh, test two babies. Um, what else? It doesn't even deal with abortion directly. There are some pretty close passages, you know, Exodus 21, 22, those, you know, you know, that shall not kill, but there's nothing directly about abortion and the ins and outs of that. Um, 
you know, you can go down the list. There's just dozens of them, and I list them all in my book. I won't belabor the point now. That scripture just doesn't cover. So what are you going to do? You're going to depend on the best opinion you can find? Well, what if that opinion is wrong? Well, then that means you're just going to lead a life of sin. Okay? So when we go to our magisterium and we say, what's the answer? And they say, well, God has given the answer infallibly to the Pope, and the Pope has said thus. There you have it. There's the truth. Now it's your responsibility to go live that truth. God's fulfilled his promise. Like Jesus said, I will lead you into all truth by the Holy Spirit. And he did that. And so now we have it. There was another question, but man, it's went way back up. So let me just go with this one. Guys, this is the, you guys were talking, so I'm thinking you're going to ask questions. Now, here's this one. Well, it says, again, it's more along the lines of agreeing with you, but maybe you can unpack the implication here again. It's, is sola scriptura self-destructive because Protestants can't even guarantee their canon is complete because they have no godly authority to canonize any holy book to begin with? In other words, to have a sola scriptura, you have to have a scriptura. And how do you know what the scriptura is? Yeah. Well, you know, I've heard this question handled in many different ways. One of the most intriguing to me was um, R.C. Sproul. Uh, he died a few years ago. Uh, but R.C. Sproul, I knew him. I asked him to debate. He refused to debate. And I wish he had not done that. I wish we could have debated because I think we could have come a long way on settling a lot of these issues. But he knew logically thinking exactly what this question is asking, which is, look, I'm going to wave my Bible on Sunday and tell people to obey. How do I even know the, the books that are in there are actually the Bible? Where am I getting that from? Uh, yeah, where are you getting that from? You're getting it from your church? Let's just say he's got it from his church. His church superiors, whoever they are, said to him, this is the Bible. Do you believe the Bible? Yes, I believe the Bible. Okay, we're telling you this is the Bible. You you accept it, correct? I accept it. You know, he came fresh out of seminary. He's he's going to go into the pastorate. He has to believe the Bible. He has to pass the consistory, the elders who are going to examine him. Well, they're the ones that told him it. But where did they get it from? Did they just make it up? Did they all sit down and try to figure out what looks belong in the Bible? No, they accepted it. Where did they accept it from? From the previous consistory or the previous generation. And so you go back and you go back and you go back. Where was the first generation? Well, that's what we call the apostles and the fathers that followed them. The apostles gave that information to the fathers, said, these are the books that we've decided that, that belong in the Bible. And the church kept perpetuating that information until Finally, in about 380 AD, the church was under some controversy about people saying, oh, this book belongs in the Bible, that book belongs in it, this book doesn't. And so the church had to make a final decision. She did so in 380 AD at the Council of Rome, and she claimed to be under the direct guidance of the Holy Spirit to do so, and she named the 27 books of the New Testament that we have today. And it's never changed. That's where we got it. Now, R.C. Sproul, he would say, well, you know, if I accept that, then I have to accept the Catholic Church is infallible. Because the only way that she could give me the correct canon was to be infallible. If she is prone to any error at all, and she even got one book wrong, that means I don't have the correct New Testament. So he realized that it had to be an infallible decision, one without error to give us what the canon is. But he couldn't accept it. Why? Because that means he would have to become Catholic. That's why. And so what he came up with is a formula that said, well, it's a fallible collection of infallible books. A fallible collection of infallible books. In other words, he, would, he had to admit that he didn't really know that the, the Bible he waved every Sunday and preached from actually contained the books of the Bible that God wanted or had some in there that shouldn't be in there because it's fallible. Now, can you live under that duress? Do you think that's the way God wanted us to live? 
not even knowing what the scripture was, much less declaring sola scriptura. I mean, you would first have to figure out what the Bible is, even to come close to claiming sola scriptura. But how can you do that if you have no means? If you're, if you're not going to accept the fact that the Holy Spirit will infallibly guide the church to give that information, however mysteriously he does it, the fact is he does it. And if he doesn't do it, then you're no better than any pagan religion because you really don't know what's in your divine scriptures. Or you don't know that some pagan put some book in there that shouldn't be in there. You just don't know it. Okay, so you can say a fallible collection of infallible books all you want. It doesn't get you anywhere. Okay, it just digs your hole further. That's what it does because it shows that you really know what's needed, but you can't accept it. This comes from a Roman Catholic apologist who's actually a mod in my, but he's playing quote unquote devil's advocate, right? So it, John 20, 31 says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. Doesn't this imply a person could pick up John's gospel, believe in and receive eternal life? And just to nuance it, if John is sufficient for salvation, now with the entire book, isn't that super sufficient? So why do we need another authority? <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like the same questions over and over again, but um, John's writing a scripture. We need a scripture. So when we read the scripture, we have to know that what we're reading is true. Okay. If John were to write something or any of the gospel writers wrote something or Paul or Peter and put something that wasn't true, well, then, of course, we wouldn't trust the scriptures, would we? Okay. So. In other words, John is writing to us because he knows the church is going to pass these letters and gospels around because that's an easy way to get information, okay? And so thus, these are written for you that you may believe on Jesus Christ. Why wouldn't they? They're talking about Jesus, and we have to believe in Jesus, so we would expect the scriptures to teach that. But it has nothing to do with sola scriptura. All he's saying is that when you pick up the scripture— you know it's true. You can read about Jesus and how you can be saved. I would expect that. I would also expect that from the tradition of the church. If it told me about what baptism was and that the water means something along with the Spirit, well, that's teaching me about salvation, isn't it? Yeah, tradition had a lot to say about salvation. And the magisterium, what are they there for? Well, Paul says in Timothy, 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, they're there to guide you in your salvation so that you don't lose your salvation, so that you do everything that's required of you, both from what we say, what the Scripture says, and what the tradition says, so that you don't falter in anything. Sorry if the questions are repetitive. I'm trying to field them out, so we're going to probably make this the last question because they're all along the same lines because they're coming from Protestants. Uh, Saturday, I actually had... A Protestant apologist articulates Sola Scriptura, and there were questions from the opposing camp. So if the questions sound the same, it's because it's basically from the Protestants who are asking questions. There are not so many from Catholics or others or even Orthodox here. So, again, if it's repetitive, I apologize for that. We'll make it the final question because I don't see anything that's just different. But here it is. Robert, what does Paul mean in 2 Timothy 3.17? That... Man is made complete, sometimes translated perfect from the Greek artios. In other words, you've heard this, that 2 Timothy says that the scripture uh, is sufficient to equip the man of God for every good work so he can be complete. So if it gives you every good work, you're complete. Isn't that sola scriptura, basically? Well, let's back up a little bit because you use the word sufficient in order to quote 2 Timothy 3.16. That's not the word he uses. It says scripture is profitable. Okay, that's the Greek word ophelomos. Uh, profitable can mean something that's helpful, it's useful, but it does not mean sufficient. If Paul wanted to use the word sufficient, there were about six other Greek words he could have used. Okay, and I put them all in my book. And, um, but he didn't use those words. So that's the first thing we need to know. So then when you get to verse 17 and you read about Artios and Katartizo was is would be the next word that Paul uses. Um, these are also fractional words. 
uh, artios or katartizo means you're well equipped, you're well equipped, you're prepared, you're you're ready for the fight, so to speak, all these kinds of things. But they're not superlative words. There's nothing in this context that Paul uses where he says, ah, scripture is your absolute, the the sufficient authority that means you don't need anything else. Okay. <laughs> it's just not there in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All the words are fractional. They all mean helpful, uh, useful, whatever, but certainly not sufficient. The, there is someone asking about the Deuterocanonicals. I don't know if it's going to be relevant. Do you think it's relevant to the topic? or? Uh, well, that would have to do with the canon. So, yeah, let's see the question. Okay, he says, uh, here it is. Why is the Deuterocanonical or canon in the Septuagint, Shimon? And I guess I'm wondering, does that mean that these books are inspired? If so, why are they only in the Septuagint and so forth and so on? But that's the question. That will be it. All right. So the... Um, the Deuterocanonical books came after the Hebrew canon was already fixed after Malachi. Okay, you have a whole Alexandrian Jews uh, that used the Septuagint because it was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, but God was not through giving scripture yet. Okay, even though the Jews may have stopped after Malachi, the Hebrew Jews, that is the Alexandrian Greek Jews were still alive and surviving right up until the time of Jesus. So we had seven more books added uh, at that time to the canon. Okay. And this is interesting because when uh, in 95 AD, when the Hebrew Jews came together in council, the council of Jamnia, uh, they decided that only their Hebrew canon was going to be the canon that the Jews would accept, but they're all Hebrew Jews. They're not Alexandrian Jews. Okay. So the Alexandrian Jews had a totally different story about what the canon was. And then, of course, um, after Jesus came and died on the cross, the Jews were not the authority to begin with anyway. They were the authority in the Old Testament, but certainly not in the New Testament. And that leaves the job to the Catholic Church to decide. And so the Catholic Church got the Hebrew canon and got the Septuagint canon, put them together, decided which of those books were canonical, which parts weren't, and there was a big hullabaloo about that, and made the final decision. So now we have to trust. Is God the Holy Spirit guiding us to choose this canon, just like he allowed us to choose the 27 books of the New Testament? Well, of course he is. He's not a halfway God. He's going to give us the complete Bible that we need, and that's what we have in the Catholic Church today. Folks, that's going to wrap it up, and I myself learned a lot, and I truly appreciate it that you clearly demonstrated Raymond Brown and <laughs> his group do not represent the historic Catholic view of Scripture because everyone heard that even though Catholics reject Sola Scriptura, you heard it. The historic position of the Catholic Church is the Bible was dictated it's the inspired, inerrant, perfect, <clears throat> infallible word of God. So you heard it. So if you hear a priest or a cardinal, because someone was saying that one of the reasons why I left the Catholic Church is because this priest said there were errors in the Bible and historical mistakes. That, again, that's not the official position. I just want Dr. Sejanus. That is not the historic position of, of the Catholic Church. There are no real errors in the Bible, right? That is correct. And unfortunately, there's a lot of priests out there who have been educated in these liberal seminaries who believe what you just said. And it's going to take a whole revolution to turn the church around to get it right. But uh, that's where we stand today. All right. Now, if they want to continue to follow you and support you and watch you, watch your, let's say, your talks, what's your YouTube channel? Um, gosh, what is my YouTube channel? <laughs> um, I tell you what. We, uh, I do a program every Tuesday and Wednesday, 8 to 10. I take questions from people, write them in, uh, two hours, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday. That's four hours a week. We are going to go to another uh, channel tomorrow. We're starting on another channel tomorrow. And my friend Jonathan, um, uh, gosh, I need to get a hold of him. If I gave you his name, could you 
yes, uh, contact him. And I'll put the, in the description box. So I'll get you, okay. if you email them to me. Yeah. And then I'll do that. But what is your website then? My website is robertsongenis.org. And they can follow you there and your books are there. And you also have not just on Sola Scriptura or even the Eucharist. You also have things related to science. So you cover a whole, whole broad spectrum. I do. It. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Would you mind coming back in the future and just talking about liberal critical scholarship like Ra 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 Raymond Brown and why this is a cancer that needs to be stopped and how to stop it? Because I know you have done talks on Raymond Brown because I yeah. thought I found one on YouTube from years ago where you were invited to talk about Raymond Brown. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, you know, even though I, you've called me on this program, I have to critique my Protestant brethren. I am closer to them in a lot of ways than I am to some of my Catholic friends, like Raymond Brown, for example. Uh, Raymond Brown, I consider a material heretic. Mm -hmm. A lot of my Protestant brethren believe what they believe because they love the Bible, and I appreciate that about them. Uh, so, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. <laughs> hey, praise God. You heard that, right, Protestants? Brown was a heretic, but you are his brothers because you love Scripture and believe it's God's Word. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sengenis, for making time and sacrificing time from your busy schedule life. And again, I really appreciate it. It's a blessing to actually now speak to you face to face. And hopefully this will be the beginning of many talks. And Lord willing, I will be in contact with you. Send me the information via email and then we'll take it from there. And God bless you guys for being good listeners. You didn't start like the Royal Rumble in the comment section. So praise God. <laughs> because I'm gonna bring more people to do more talks of this nature, to give them a platform so you can hear all sides and seek the Holy Spirit as he guides you into all truth. So Christ is risen, risen indeed. God bless you.